thank you. Well, guys, thanks for coming along. Um, I appreciate the you know, last session of the day. You may want to head off and get beer, given there's already free beer out there. So I'll try not to detain you. Someone already has one. That's good. I should have done the same. Um, I'll try not to detain you all too long. Um, what I wanted to do was just kind of run through some slides, but not too many, because you're probably approaching PowerPoint death by now, um, and then kick off into some demos. Now, two caveats on the demos. The first is they may or may not work, because you know, I haven't really tested them. Uh, the second is the font size is going to blow. So if you can't read it, you're going to find coming forward is going to help. So when we get to that, uh, or if any of you know how to increase the fonts on the Postman packaged app, just let me know, because I'm struggling with it. So um, am I going the wrong direction? Good. So we're all about, we're all about RESTConf today. Great. Someone's coming forward. Um, so I was going to give a very, very quick introduction to the OpenSDN controller and what it is. Um, very, very quick introduction to Yang, likewise, uh, in that that's the modeling language we use for all of these APIs. And then get straight into RESTConf, what the APIs are, and then straight into the demo, where what I wanted to do was just like walk through some of the APIs that we have. Uh, and then give you some kind of clues as to where you can go after this to get more information. One thing to say on that is uh, there's a bunch of us over on the one of the pods over there doing STN apps. Um, you can find me there pretty much any time. And any questions you have, just come up and bug me. Um, so what is the, the open STN controller? Well, Cisco is one of the main drivers behind the Open Daylight project. So that's an open source STN controller. Um, it's perhaps a little different to uh, some of the other controllers out there in that the focus is really on integration and having lots of different southbound protocols. Um, and I'll come on to how we model those in Yang and how we then can access them through RESTCOMP. So yes, SDN, but don't sort of hyper-focus on OpenFlow because it's about much more than that. But what we do with the Cisco controller is we take that Open Daylight controller that's pretty much just a java.tar.gz file that we give you and you unzip. So instead of that, what we do is we ship this as a Linux VM, ready integrated, um, logging UI and stuff like that. It's already integrated. Um, Cisco stand behind it and support it. Um, limited availability already, av already out there. Uh, we've made it so that you can either run it standalone or you can run it as a three node cluster. And in the clustering mode, it's always going to be an odd number. Three is our initial point. Uh, and how that's going to work is there's always got to be two nodes up. And if any node finds itself on its own, then it figures, well, I must have fallen out of the cluster, and so the other two take over. Um, as we scale out in future, it'll always be an odd number, but the numbers will get bigger. Uh, and that's where we'll get horizontal scaling for performance as the clusters get bigger. So yeah, doing a whole ton of demos here. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of stuff online that you can go through. So we've based it on the Open Daylight controller. The shipping release of that is Helium. Um, as with all open source projects, you know, it's no longer good enough to have release numbers like 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. They've got to be funky names, usually alliterative. Um, but we, I guess instead of going through, well, not alliterative, but you know, like the letters of the alphabet type stuff, like with OpenStack, and I know OPNFV are doing the same. We went for the periodic table. So Helium's out there now. Uh, we're on the third patch release of Helium. Uh, lithium is coming very soon. But the Cisco Open SDN controller is currently based on Helium. Once Lithium's out there and we've qualified it, tested it, et cetera, there'll be another release of the Open SDN controller. I mentioned already the, uh, the range of southbound protocols and the focus on scale with things like clustering. But the key is that you know, when you pick the controller up, whether it's the open source one or the Cisco one, you can add apps to it yourself. So you can write code either inside the controller using Java or on top of it using RESTConf. And focusing today on the RESTConf API is really because that's a much easier way to get up to speed. Um, you know, the, the Java API is not only that, I guess, programming in Java is a little bit harder than, than uh, with things like Python and JavaScript. But also, there's a higher learning curve, I guess, to figuring out how to write code inside the controller and be tightly bound into that. Certainly for me, I've, I've done everything with RESTConf that I've done. So we'll just go for examples there. Um, I can show code, but I was thinking of just sticking to 
postman so that I can show you the APIs themselves and the responses you get. So the, the challenge in this is that everything is modeled. So that's a great thing because we can generate APIs on the fly from models. The downside is as a user of this, you've got a, the sort of first step of that learning curve is getting your head around the models and how the models are structured, how you read the models. What we do have that's really helpful is um, one of my colleagues here wrote a demo, well, I guess we kind of package it with the controller, but it's more for learning than as an app you'd use in production. And what it is is an app that lets you go through the models, see the structure, see what happens when you fill data in, what comes back. Uh, so as a teaching aid, that's fantastic. And um, so what was I going to say about this? Well, everything is model driven. We started with a, a more hand coded approach. Um, but as of now, you know, everything that we're doing in open daylight is driven from these Yang models. So we use them as effectively our IDL or interface description language between different components. So we have over 300 Yang models now in, in open daylight helium. The number's up to over 500 in lithium, and it'll just keep going up. And that's kind of in contrast to the IETF, where we've standardized half a dozen models so far, and we have a, probably 100 odd more being written at the moment, because everyone's jumped onto it in the last couple of months. Some of the observations I'd have there is the quality of the open daylight models is way higher than of those new models we're seeing in, in IETF, where really people get all excited with this new thing and dive in and start writing before they know how to read, which if you'd ever tried that as a child, wouldn't have worked out so well. Um, so the thing to say is that um, all of this came from the NetConf um, effort within ITF, which was all about device configuration. And NetConf standardized on XML as its encoding right from the get-go. Uh, and then Yang came a little later. So then Yang was bound quite tightly initially to XML. The good news is it doesn't have to be bound to XML, and it doesn't have to be bound to device configuration. And so that's what I'll be showing you today is where we're using JSON as well as XML, and where we're talking to a controller rather than down to a router. There is also, um, for writing tools, we also have a way of expressing the models themselves in XML. So not the data that's going over the wire, but the actual model it makes it easier to, to do the tooling. But the models themselves are actually uh, much more like sort of C, Java kind of programs in as much as there's lots of curly brackets and semicolons. And the way they're structured is you, each module is its own file. It may import and include other ones. Um, one thing that you see an awful lot of in models is this pattern where you have um, a container where we give the container a plural name. Then within that, you see a list with a singular name. And what that lets you do is it lets you get all of the entries in the list by referencing the container. But if you want to get an individual element in the list, you give the list name and then also the key to that list. And the key can be singular or compound. So if your key is just the name, you would just give that. But if your key had multiple things in it, you'd have to put all those in. And how that comes out of REST comp, we'll see in a moment, is all just as a URL. So we're mapping these model structures into HTTP URLs. So at first, um, when I first came across Open Daylight, I guess a couple of years ago when I jumped into it, it was all, um, it felt like magic incantations. People would say to me, this is the URL you need to hit, and this is the data you need to pass in. And I had no idea why. So there's a huge payback to understanding why, and then you can basically figure stuff out for yourself as you go on. And that's where I'd really recommend looking at that Yang UI tool that my colleague Yuri wrote. So the key thing here is to say, well, what is it all about ultimately is the models are basically being used to model the data we're going to put on the wire as we talk to a device or as we talk to a controller. So then, actually, when we put it on the wire, initially for NetConf, it was all XML. And that was being carried effectively over, typically, SSH, and using RPCs as the base mechanism and then building configuration commands, et cetera, on top of that. But as we come to RESTConf, which is what we're looking at today, we're using HTTP for the operation. So instead of these bespoke netconf operations like get config, edit config, you see classic HTTP operations like get, put, post, delete, etc. The challenge there is that if you're using just a web browser, all you can issue is get. So really, the first thing you want to do when you want to dig into the models 
is to use something like REST Client or Postman so that you can issue puts and posts and deletes as well. But the next thing we did to make it easy is we said, well, you can encode with XML, but you can also encode with JSON. Now, if you're using Postman, it's probably much of a muchness. But it's when you start programming and start trying to hit this with Python or JavaScript, you're going to find it's a ton easier to use JSON than it is to use um, XML. We also now, we're seeing the same Yang models being used in other ways. So for example, I2RS is how we, we're looking to put more dynamic configuration onto routers uh, in terms of ephemeral things like routes, adding routes, deleting routes, et cetera. But also within Open Daylight itself, as I mentioned earlier, we very much use Yang as our format for interfacing between everything. So all of the Java objects that we have are, are still Yang models. But how that comes out in terms of the RESTConf APIs is that we can take all the Yang models that we know about. Those could either be the 500 plus in lithium or 300 plus in helium models within the controller. Or they could be models we learn from devices we mount with NetConf. And from those, we provide the internal Java APIs. But as we're looking at today, external RESTConf APIs. So RESTConf, I mean, it is what it says. It's REST-like. It's not a pure REST API, if any of you know the sort of rules of REST. But um, I've forgotten the guy's name now who, who claims to have invented REST. But he has a whole set of rules. And one of them is that you shouldn't have a schema, and everything should be figured out from the, the HTTP itself. Uh, and it doesn't adhere to that. But the great thing is that, the, as I say, the APIs are generated at runtime, uh, and they follow the model, so you can look at the model and see what to expect in the API. So it probably just says everything I've already said. So running over HTTP with standard HTTP operations, uh, the data is all defined in Yang, accessing NetConf data stores, whether on a device or the controller. Um, and what you then find is that you can find the list of all the models you support on the controller from basically going to controller slash rest comp and the module. But really where it gets interesting is when you then dig down into the actual configuration or state. And that's really determined by a statement in the Yang model as to which you're dealing with. I mentioned XML and JSON. Somebody yesterday in the uh, panel we had was talking about being Python programmers against XML. As I say, much easier to stick to JSON. So how that then looks in the controller is you have this whole structure, and the top is the interesting bit, the config and operational, because that's where you get it, your config state, your config and the operational state. Um, another thing to, to think about, I guess, is operations is where we have all the RPCs. So we can define RPCs against this. So a classic example is where you're adding config. At the moment, we do it from like adding an, a router to, the, to be mounted by the controller. As you'll see in a moment, at the moment we do that by basically adding the configuration to say, I want this router connected. The thing is, that will immediately return and say, hey, that's OK. What you don't know is, has it really connected? So perhaps what we might do in future is define an RPC that does that connection and only responds once it's connected, rather than you having to poll to see when it's connected. So there is, you know, sometimes the RPCs can be useful for that kind of stuff. And with OpenFlow, for example, you can either add flows by configuring them or you can add them by hitting an RPC. So yeah, I mentioned the config and operational data stores. And so those really are what you'll see yourself hitting as you issue commands in Postman or from Python scripts, et cetera. Um, and the structure you always have is slash rest comp slash either config or operational. And then you have the name of the, of the Yang model and then a top level data structure within it, a container. And then from there, the URL will just grow and grow. And you'll see that in my examples. You can access anything that's a container or a list. You can't access leaf lists or leaves, so the very bottom data structures. What you do is you hit a list entry, and that gives you all the leaves under that list. Uh, and I mentioned already support for RPCs. So one um, small area in which the Cisco distribution of Open Daylight, the Cisco Open SDN controller, differs from the open source open daylight is that we have this um, authentication scheme. Uh, and this is really something that our security guys said to us, you know, you, this thing's way too open. It needs to be better locked down. So instead of just going in with HTTP on a different port number, 
This should all be done over HTTPS, and we should have a way that it's session-based authentication. So when you first connect from your script or from Postman, you'll go in and issue this command to get yourself a token, and then every time you hit the thing again, you, issue, you give it the token so it knows you're authenticated. So the first example, and I'll show the question. Oh, we have a microphone coming. The little authentication, that token thing that you, that you talked about, that Cisco's doing, are yeah. you planning on passing that to the uh, open daylight, open source? Um, I don't think so, because what actually happens um, in terms of token is, is I believe, you know, basically, the controller's still there, but it's being front-ended by Tomcat. And then you're going into that and doing the authentication. It's not something that would be needed as part of the open source. It's a fairly, you know, anyone else could do the same thing in 10 minutes by front-ending the controller with another web application server. So I guess that's not necessary. It's a pretty standard piece of functionality. So when you want to configure the controller, the way you do that, in fact, is by have the controller almost connects to itself. It exposes a NetConf server with its data store that you can then access to configure it. So what you'll see if you, you, know, if you were to go into the Linux operating system in the controller and do a netstat minus an grep 1830, you would see this connection to yourself. And it's through that connection that you will configure everything. Um, one thing you see with um, any, any time that we're accessing a data store that isn't intrinsic to the controller, or a model that's not intrinsic to the controller, but it's one we've mounted through NetConf, including this config case, you'll all see this YangX mount in your URL. And then after the YangX mount, you'll then see the, the model that we're getting at, which pretty much everything for config is in config. And config modules, that's where we configure all the different capabilities. But we use the same, the same methodology for external NetConf devices. So, and I'll show this in a moment. We post to config modules to add the router, and then the controller will connect to it. It'll pull in the list of all the different models that device supports. It'll put that in its inventory, which now means from, from here on in, when you want to issue a command against it, the controller quickly knows, without having to ask the device, is that command you've issued a valid command? because it knows what capabilities you have. I could probably show an example of that going wrong. Um, but then also, we cache those models. Because back to that slide earlier, where we were generating the APIs, we were doing that from a set of models that we knew. So if we don't already have the model, we have to cache it, so we've got that. But if it's another device of the same type, there won't be any new models to cache when you connect to it. Finally, with you know, a device of another type, so we've worked with the OpenWRT guys on NetConf Yang, and that would have a different set of capabilities, so we'd cache those. One thing worth saying is if you had two devices of different software releases, you'd probably find there were different versions of models in there, and that's why we always take the Yang revision statement from the model and put that in the file name and the cache so we can distinguish between different versions. So then we want to reach through and touch something underneath the controller. So typically, you'll put or post to a giant URL. And that's what I said earlier about how the URLs get longer and longer. What I've done with Postman is I've created um, various environments within Postman, which I'm putting on GitHub. And you'll be able to get access to those that basically parameterize a lot of this stuff. Because otherwise, you just go crazy with the length of the URLs you're having to type in. Um, because the, you know, the first section's getting you as far as saying, this is the node I'm dealing with. Then you're saying, well, I'm mounting stuff on that node. And then I'm off in that node, again, going all the way through to find something. And it can get a lot longer than this. So yeah, Postman um, environments are your friend here. But again, if you're, if you're coding this, of course, that's not an issue. Because you just tend to put variables in your Python scripts to get you down to different sections that you want to get to. So yeah, let's kick off pretty much into a demo of these different areas that I've listed. Um, so looking at the inventory, devices that are mounted, looking at BGP and PSAP. Um, we can look at topology that emerges from that. With a bit of luck, we can look at over OpenFlow as well. 
I have a little bit of a challenge here with the VPN, the VPN client I have on here, that I can either access devices in my lab or I can access the Ubuntu uh, VM that's running on that SSD. I can't do both at once. So I'm going to kick off the VPN and hope that the Ubuntu thing works. So we'll see how we go. So this is the bit where you all may have trouble with your eyesight. Oh, hang on. I'll get rid of that for now. So is, is any of this visible? Well, let's see what the font size is when we come back. So if, for example, um, I look at a controller to see what, ah, this is where I may still be trying to hit the Ubuntu. Yes, I am. So back to my environment variable trick, I just switch to whichever device I want to hit. And the nice thing with using the environments and parameters in Postman is you can abstract away from whether you're going into the Cisco controller with those annoying tokens or whether you're going to the open source one that doesn't have them. You can just hide that in your environment so you don't have to change your Postman collections. Um, so there you go. When I start off, and is that font visible? There's initially only one node. You can just see one little piece of green text, and that is that connection to itself, to the controller. So all you do from there, and in fact, if you look at all the different models that are there, all you see initially is all the different models that are supported by the controller and being configured. So it's a huge slew of stuff. But what then gets interesting is if I add in some devices, so, so I can add, um, for example, add some routers. And what you find with all of these puts and posts is that you don't really get anything back. You just get a sort of an OK or a no content. Um, but you can check that it's worked by then. So in this case, if I go back to the configured nodes, you now see two pieces of green text, because I've added one. And then when you get to operational, so that's what I mentioned, the config data store and the operational data store. For nodes, the config one just gives you the IDs. So that's pretty dull. The operational one is now telling me every capability these devices have. So this is the controller config, the self-connection, which has a ton of stuff. But if I hide that one, see the XR node hasn't mounted yet. And that's what I mentioned about having to poll it repeatedly to, to get it to mount. So if I do that again, with a bit of luck, the demo gods are with me, and it's now mounted. Uh, and you can now see a ton of different models. But then again, you can step through, as I mentioned with the URL at the top, you can just keep adding stuff to go to the next level down. So if I just go to that XR node now and send that, you'll no longer see the controller config because I've now stepped further on in my URL. And now I can start going into the node and looking at these different things. So for example, um, and I mentioned the Yang X mounts, which the people in the front row might see. And then I pick a model that's in there. And with a bit of luck, I've asked it for all of its interface configurations. So I mentioned earlier about containers and lists. And if you can see, the structure here is we have a container with a plural name, and the list has a singular name, and then you have each of the list entries. And this list is kind of a funny one, because the key here is actually a composite. It's not just the interface name. It's whether the interface is genuinely there or whether it's just been pre-configured. And so you have to, to know that that was the, I mentioned earlier about the kind of magic incantations. When I started doing this, I just did what people told me. Once you learn to read the Yang models, you can see there's a list. And that list has a key that has these two different things in. And that's what tells you, OK, that, that's what I need to do here, is go through both of them. So if I do that then, and pick an individual interface, Um, let's do a gigabit one, because that's kind of interesting. So here's an annoying thing about RESTConf, which is that um, slashes have to be escaped, and our interface names have slashes in. Because the slash is what separates the different parts of the model, but it's in the interface name. So I've had to stick in a bunch of percent 2s. Kind of annoying. Um, and now I'm down to just one just one interface and getting the, the, the information on just one. And then I can go another step down, for example, and pick the network. 
or a bit of luck. So this is the IPv4 information. Um, ah, see, it doesn't like me doing that because I don't think I needed the model net. Ah, I see. I forgot my slash. Great. Um, and so on, you just keep going. I'm now down to my primary address, so there is only that one. And as I mentioned, I, you can't access individual leaves. So my URL's grown, and it, it has grown a lot. Um, but it won't get any further, because now if I want to get an individual address, it's going to fail, because it's told me it's got to be a container or list. I can't access just that individual leaf. But that's not a problem, because um, you know, ultimately, I can still get at that data by going one level up. Um, and I mentioned puts and posts. So if, for example, we do this, there's a description on there. I could change the description. So that's the, other, the next thing is this whole, the, the issue of how do you post stuff in when you have to know what you're putting in. So with a bit of luck, change that to a post or a put. Um, some existing data. This will probably fail because I haven't planned it out. Aha. Oh, I see. I, w I was hitting the operational data. And then I didn't tell it the media type. So that's the other thing on posting. You have to tell it what media type you're putting in. Great, so that's gone in. So now if I go back to do a get, what you should find is the interface description has changed. And it was saying link to switch one. It's now saying hello world. Um, and if, if you didn't believe me, I could, I could SSH into the router and show you that. Um, Another thing, I mentioned XML and um, JSON. So if we wanted to get the information back in XML, we would just change the, what we wanted to accept and say, I only want XML. And so you get the same data now in XML. And you saw the original post I did to add the node was XML. The, the second one to change the interface was JSON. So you have that flexibility. Another thing I guess to put is to go into then is um, topologies and BGP, PSEP, etc. So if I quickly do a few posts to set the rib up, ah, uh, that's a problem with my. Uh, I didn't save that. Great, and then here, so I can change my variable names. Oops. So now I've, what I've done now is I've basically configured BGP, added a peer. Um, so what you'll now see is if I go into the topologies, um, PSEP's there anyway because the nodes are configured to connect to the router. So that would already have been there, all this PSEP stuff. Um, but you can now see that BGP link state topology has arrived. So all of this stuff is information on links and how much bandwidth is on the links. So all of that's visible through those APIs. Um, I mentioned with PSEP, that's worth looking at quickly. So I can get it just that PSEP topology, but then I can start to add LSPs. So and again, it's sort of very helpful, these very helpful messages you get back. Output, uh, nothing. Because it's, it's just a function that says, here's all the parameters to put in. I don't get anything out. Uh, but what you see then when you go into the topology, with a bit of luck, yeah, going to this first, the first uh, the node I hit, you can now see that an LSP is being created. And with a bit of luck, if I were to go into the CLI, you'd actually see that in the system. Um, I don't know if this would categorize as brave or foolish. I remember how I make these larger. It's, uh, da, 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 da. somebody remind me. 
Oh, big, that's it, isn't it? Ah, so obviously I gave, must have given it the wrong path because it's actually down. It's added it, but it didn't come up. Because that's the danger of a demo. It's probably an old path statement. So you can see at least that config goes in. And if I then uh, delete it from the API, so delete LSP, I think it's the same one. Fire that in. And it's, it's disappeared. So you can see PSET's pushing stuff in. And PSET, you kind of have two options. One is where, you, um, where the LSP is already configured on the router, and the router just hands off to PSET the job of figuring out paths. Or there's this other mode where the whole thing's created dynamically. Questions, always good. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> when you did, when you just did the, 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 the push yep. configuration, uh, the, the communication between uh, the open the open controller yes. and your iOS XR yes. was in netconf. That's PSET. That was in so netconf. No, it's PSET, which is the path computation element protocol. So it's a different protocol that's specifically for adding label switch paths dynamically. Now, you could do similar stuff through NetComp. So I could add an LSP at the CLI using NetComp. But in this case, it's been added using a, you know, a more dynamic approach. Okay. Repeat the, the, what, so, what so we support, um, in the controller, uh, we support NetComp. Okay. So I could have added it with NetComp. Um, but that would be adding it from the CLI. It would be put permanently in the CLI. Whereas with PSET, what you're doing is you're adding something using a client server protocol. Um, if the PSEP controller went away, then the LSP would go away. But you have a say that flexibility. You can add from the CLI and say, I only want to use PSEP for path calculation. Or you can say, I want, the, P I want the, the path computation element to push stuff down. So it's just a different protocol for doing it. And the, um, the original goal of PSEP was to solve the problem of inter-domain traffic engineering. So the problem you always have with traffic engineering is you could only see your local area. With PSET, the controller can see all the different areas, so it can push an LSP that goes across multiple domains. And then, yeah, with BGP, so um, actually try and make that bigger still. So you can see this, this BGP connection was the one that I configured at the open daylight end, and it's now up, and we're exchanging routes over it. Um, I could probably, the next thing we see how to advertise routes. So if I do a show route BGP, you'll see that we've only got routes from within our own network. So what about if I get open daylight to advertise as a route? So I would go into my app route section. I would we have this thing in, in the BGP. Uh, originally, the BGP and open daylight was solely for learning routes. Uh, supports v4, v6, and link state. Link state is what we use to get IGP information. So in your XR config, under OSPF or ISIS, you'll say distribute BGPLS, and that will make it push those routes out over BGPLS. Um, but we also have v4 and v6. In fact, if I um, pull those in, so you can see them um, at the routes, probably. So you can see those same routes I could see from the CLI, the BGP routes, have also been learned by the controller. Um, and that could be you know, complete with you know, multiple AS, AS hops in the path and that sort of thing. The nice thing there, and we had an intern do some stuff on this a couple of years ago, well, last year, I guess. Um, and she uh, wanted to write some sort of routing analytics stuff. Um, quick plug for routing analytics. We have the BMP stuff here, if you've been down there. Uh, BMP is a way of doing. Um, not just getting the routes off one router, but the routes from all of its peers and pulling them back. Uh, currently, that's standalone, but we are integrating that to the controller. Um, but yeah, she was doing some work on analytics. And the thing is, if you're a web developer, you really don't want to be messing around with decoding BGP TLVs. So the great thing with this is it's the same information you get in BGP, but it's now in a much more friendly format. So you can get at that. Um, we also, you know, that effectively goes into a topology uh, but topology really just ends up being a list of nodes and prefixes. 
So yeah, the at rib. So if I add that in, this now means I can, I can add routes. So if I post a route in, so it's 1.2.3.4 slash 32. So I'm pushing that in from the API. And with a, let's say with a bit of luck, I did have that. Uh, was it this one? Yeah. So now you can see that 1.2.3.4 has come in. So that's kind of useful for, um, we've had some people look at using that for things like DDoS mitigation, where you could easily put an API on top of the controller to say, just, I want to scratch this one prefix. Or using BGP flow spec, which we're also adding into the controller now, you could actually say, it's this five tuple that's worrying me. Can we please bitbucket that? And then using BGP, we can communicate from the controller to the route reflector infrastructure say, OK, this slash 32, it's bad news. Please bitbucket it. And then the route reflectors will spread that out to all the different devices. So you think, you know, in terms of sort of productivity, if you think about when you used to have to do that with expect scripts and that sort of thing, now very easy that you can just hit the controller using Python or using Postman, whatever, and that, that then happens. So um, I mentioned BGP flow spec. Probably then the final thing to do um, is to show you OpenFlow. So for that, I need to drop off my VPN and pray a little bit. So if I change this to be my local setup. Um, so what I have here is, um, is a bunch of stuff running in VMware. So it's just an Ubuntu VM. The reason I'm running the controller under Ubuntu rather than just under um, the Mac itself is because um, I wanted to run Mininet for the, the OpenFlow stuff. Um, unfortunately, my lab in San Jose only has um, XRVR devices, which is why I'm running Mininet here for this. Um, so I've, I've set up a little Mininet network. I've got a controller running there. Um, so if we go to open, well, first thing, the same, um, ah, I didn't put my authorization in. Good. So we have the controller config. That's all we've got at this point. But if you look at the operational nodes, um, you can now see OpenFlow as well. So OpenFlow nodes have been added in. So as an example, if I go to Mininet uh, and I do the sort of ping, oops, you'll see that I, you know, the ping isn't working, um, host unreachable. So how do I fix that? Well, I just simply go into the uh, OpenFlow API. Um, I'm going to need to make ARP work. So I'll add the ARPs to both sides. Um, I'll then add a flow um, to allow pings. I think I've got the right ether type. Yep. And assuming I pick the right ports, um, I haven't picked the right ports, you see. This is the danger of demo. Um, what you can also do is get the flows. For example, get the full list out. Um, I don't know why I messed those up. I probably put the wrong port numbers in or something. Um, yeah, I think so. Maybe I put the wrong ones. Then the, um, that's probably about that. Um, and again, the URLs will sort of grow as you go through to the next step each time. So if there's nothing there, you'll get not found. But equally, eventually, I'll find a flow that I created. Or maybe I didn't. Maybe that was the problem. Ah, never, never demo like this. It's crazy. Check my flow numbers. It's two, three. Ah, oh, OK, zero. Should have gone in one. Ah, oh, yes, flows have gone in. So, um, yes, yeah, so you can see, for example, the uh, this is the IP one. So, matching the IP ether type, matching port one, protocol one, which is ping, and then saying I wanted it to go to port two and port three. This was because I was doing something where I was tapping stuff. So, I wanted to say any, any pings there, as well as sending them to where they were going 
I was going to send them somewhere else to tap them. Um, so I don't know why, why they're not actually responding, because certainly the, the flows are in there. Um, Yeah, we have one there. We have the ARP, which is good. And we should have the other ARP. Yeah, so that's pretty strange. Um, and then, you know, I guess through OpenFlow, what gets a little tricky, again, sort of reading the models, but also you've got to be aware whether you're doing OpenFlow 1.0 or 1.3, because some of the capabilities are only in 1.3 and aren't in 1.0, which I found with Mininet, the, the base build of Mininet was 1.0, and I had to get a newer one to get 1.3 in. But you can do pretty much any of those normal, you know, modifying MAC addresses, modifying IP addresses, et cetera. So I must apologize for demo gods not being on my, not being on my side today. That's terrible. Um, so I pretty much covered, yeah. So we've got NetConf Yang. So that's where we're uh, mounting remote devices under the controller. BGP LS and PSET. So that's uh, accessing topology and programming flows. Open flow programming flows, but using open flow rather than using PSAP to create LSPs. As I mentioned, BGP itself, you know, we can do BGP v4 and v6 if you want to get things like internet routes. Um, one other thing that's worth mentioning very briefly is the through the TLF NCS acquisition. So the TLF products included NCS, which is a kind of configuration engine, which we're now branding as NSO. You can mount that underneath the controller. At which point, then, if you have a device like, um, you know, an iOS Classic device that doesn't have any NetConf Yang support, you can get at it through that because that can take a CLI and render it in Yang. Equally, um, you know, BGPLS um, is only uh, in XR again, not in iOS Classic. So an easy way to work around that, if you have an OSPF network of Classic devices, is to get an XRV instance, put it there in the network it can peer with OSPF or ISIS to the rest of your devices, then it can export routes up using BGPLS to the controller, which can then see those topologies. So it pays sometimes to think a little creatively when you're trying to get to a solution. You know, if, it, if the device you're trying to access doesn't have the capabilities you want, you can often find a way to patch around that. But as I mentioned, we're on, um, we have STN apps sort of way over that side of DevNet. Uh, we have a ton of apps that we can show. So, for example, the BGPLS and PSEP stuff I showed from Postman, we have an app written in Python that lets you, uh, for example, just pick two nodes. It knows the topology and it knows all the um, metrics. And it, instead of just giving you the best path, it'll give you a list of all the possible paths between those two nodes. And then you pick the one you feel like using, and it uses PSEP to program that into the network. Um, and that was written by somebody who yeah, it's network aware, but it's not, you know, he's seeing it very much as here's an app I'm writing. The UI stuff on top of it was written by someone who really isn't a networking guy. So the pretty graphics end up being done by a guy who's really just a web developer, very good web developer. I mean, he doesn't care less about networks. You know, he, he can take that topology that's just a list of links and list of nodes and then render that using, you know, sort of uh, web development frameworks, basically. So we had, um, as an anecdote, we had an interesting, uh, experience about six weeks ago, we ran an open daylight boot camp in Beijing. Uh, and as part of that, we got them all to a hackathon. We had teams of three. Uh, one of the teams did an amazing job was three guys of whom one was a UI person, one was a network engineer who couldn't code but knew networks. The other one was a hardcore coder, granted one who'd never seen Python before but was a really good coder. And they knocked up a demo in 24 hours, basically doing, um, figuring out best paths across the network using a different, it wasn't SPF, it was something else. I can't remember what, remember what it was. But you know, they could knock that up in basically an overnight coding session and have an app with a graphical front end where you could pick two nodes and figure out the path between them. So the, you know, the productivity that you can achieve through that using those APIs is, is pretty amazing. Um, you know, it's a change of thinking from what we're all used to in terms of um, you know, most of us being network engineers and being used to going in at the CLI. But compared to sort of expect scripts where you're having to parse the response you get and worry about the fact that you know, the, pro the uh, CLI might have changed, you know, all that sort of thing goes away. And I mentioned again with BGP, you know, what would you rather do? Get a, a list of routes where um, they're encoded in something like JSON that you can natively pull into Python as objects, or would you rather have a bunch of TLVs you've got to decode? It's, it's kind of a no-brainer. 
Um, so to me, that's with the control of the two big things you get. Um, you know, one is that uh, sort of syntax conversion, that you're not having to deal with these annoying binary protocols as a coder or this annoying CLI. Your syntax is something that maps really nicely into web development languages, um, you know, whether you're using JSON or XML. But the other thing you get is that network-wide view. So like I said, with you know, showing with BGPLS how you then can see the, the topology of the whole network. And that, you know, that, that then in itself is very powerful. So with, with one line of Python, um, I can hit the, I could probably show that, but I'm probably, given that the demo gods are frowning on me so much, I'm sure I shouldn't be doing this. Um, which box am I on? Are we still good? Oh yeah, I'm off the VPN, of course. Yes, that's never going to work. I won't do it then. Um, it, literally in one line of Python, you can hit that topology, that's your, your whole uh, IGP topology, and say, okay, give me a list of all the, um, all the nodes in that network sorted by IP address. You can literally do that in one line of Python, which is then quite handy if you have something you want to do to all those devices, because here's my list of devices. And now perhaps I can go in and issue a command against each of them using NetComp, for example. Um, and so really, it's, it, in the end, it's a question of what is it you want to do. And, and I guess that's where I struggle sometimes, having not been in a, a kind of hands-on network operations role now for like 10 or more years. So probably you guys are going to be better to come up with those examples of things you want to do. So what I'd say is figure out what it is you want to do, then come and talk to us, um, and then we'll help you make it happen. Because ultimately, that's where we want to get to. Um, and that's one final quick plug. Um, You know, it's that ultimately it is all about community. And so we've got the, um, the whole DevNet organization that you know, we're representing here. And on the portal, it's all up there. You can download stuff. Um, as I mentioned, those, some of those Postman collections, I'm putting all that stuff on GitHub. So we'll make sure that's all available through the portal in the end. Um, there's also, <coughs> for example, you know, customers who are, who are trying to do stuff and hitting issues. They'll ask questions, and we have people pretty much monitoring that all the time. The guy who monitors it, if he can't answer it and nobody else has answered it within a few hours, he'll basically stick an email out internally and say, can somebody please fix this? And then when I have a spare hour a couple of days later, I'll go through and figure it out. Um, and I think in the end, that's the thing with, the, you know, with, with our package version of the controller, is that you know, it's about having the support from Cisco. Now, we know there are some customers, particularly a lot of the really big tier one carriers, they're probably quite happy to be self-supporting and to engage with the open source community and do that, because they have teams of people who can do it. But if there's just one or two of you, it's really nice to be able to come to us and ask a question and get an answer with some kind of an SLA on that. So you know, I would encourage you to, to pick this stuff up. Just kind of get a feel for it all. Start playing with those APIs. And then as I say, then the next thing is to think, well, what is it that's been bugging me for the last year or two? What is it I can't do up to now? that I'd really like to be able to do. And then we can figure out, you know, can the controller fix that for you? So yeah, my apologies for um, the demo gods. I'll, I'll go beat them up later. And um, yeah, any, any questions? I mean, we've still got five minutes, so. Can we offer the sweatshirts for Yeah, yeah, questions? well. For... I, have, I have two sweatshirts, and so if, uh, the first two qu big questions. Uh, OK, can get two a questions. They both, get, they both get sweatshirts, so there you go. If all else fails, we may have to give them to people who already ask questions. <laughs> That's true. Only one of them ran away, I think. <laughs> Go on, then. Does Viral support a good yeah. enough code release of XR? To... Yes, so we have. Um, that's quite often how we do this. So the, the, I think the D Cloud setup for Open Daylight actually uses Viral. So the, they have like a VM that runs Open Daylight, and then they have. Um, a viral setup that has a bunch of nodes in it, and those are just XRVRs, yeah. Any more questions? Okay, go on then. <laughs> it seems like you have like multiple controllers. Which controller um, should the customer choose? Because there's actually the uh, open SDN controller, yeah. and there's APIC EM. Yeah. How would one, as a customer, choose yeah. which controller to use? I can tell you've been planted in the audience, because that's a really good plug for the panel that we have tomorrow, uh, where we have a panel on controllers. 
Um, so a bunch of us from representing the different controllers will be having a discussion. I guess the way I would probably frame it is that, you know, the APIC ACI kind of approach is pretty much if you're bought into that as an end-to-end -end solution using the Nexus 9000s, wanting to do policy-based stuff, that's the right way to go. Um, if you're an enterprise, then APIC EM is the right way to go because that's very good at using CLI to access Cisco devices. Um, and I think where we're seeing Open ALIs and Cisco Open SDN controllers much more on the service provider side. Um, I think because you know, it provides really an open framework that you can write apps on top of. Um, I'm not an APKM guy, but it seems that with APKM you get the apps already provided for you. Well, I haven't shown you any apps, I've shown you a bunch of API. So if you're not happy to go off and write the apps, that's probably not ideal. And from my own experience, years ago when I did work in an enterprise, you know, the, the number of people who could write code who had some network awareness was probably you know, two of us maybe. Um, and that, that's the challenge you often have at enterprises, just because of the scale. So, you know, APKM is really designed to help you with that. Whereas the open SDN controller, as I say, it's perhaps an intermediate point between pure open daylight at one end, where you've got to be completely self-supporting and engage with the open source community. APKM, the other end, where it's very much will provide everything for you. That's kind of a midpoint where you write your own apps that will help you. And maybe that's a way of seeing it. <laughs> Oh, the panel. See, that's typical of me. I can't remember. I've got to find it on my phone. Um, as you can tell from this, I only thought about this about an hour ago. Um, I tend to just pitch up. And the question was, what time is the panel tomorrow? Yeah. It's, um, it is. Uh, actually, we have a bunch of stuff tomorrow. So the panel discussion is, I believe, at, I can check here that I'm in the right time zone, at 11 AM. Um, we actually, at 2.30, we have a getting started with open daylight. So if you want to come along and I guess we'll try and make the slides different from the ones I did today and kind of focus on how you get it up and running, how you install it, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure I have at least one other thing tomorrow, uh, which must, must be open daylight related, but I'm not sure where that is. Um, I think uh, one of my colleagues has another session on Thursday uh, looking at sort of notification aware apps, so how you can do stuff that's reacting to notifications from the network. So, I mean, look through the agenda. There's a, there's a, a bunch more stuff to come on Open Daylight, so. You mentioned just a bit ago that uh, we just looked at APIs, right? Sorry, uh, the... That we just looked at APIs. We haven't yes. actually looked at any code, right? Are yeah. you aware of any efforts out there for any good object wrappers or just generally wrappers around any of the APIs that we've looked at? Yeah, there are actually, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, one of my colleagues has done a whole bunch of, and I don't know what, what our plans are yet for distributing these, but one of my colleagues has built a whole bunch of kind of Python wrappers around the REST APIs, so to make life easier when you're coding in Python. Um, and I expect we might see that for other languages as well, like language bindings that just make your life easier. I think also whether through the language bindings or whether on the controller itself, I would like to see us start to generate some higher level APIs. So I mentioned that example of you know, how I had to add the, add the node to NetConf, and then I had to look at the operational thing to see it. I think we need some convenience APIs where you say add the node and don't come back until you've done it. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think we will see more of those things emerging. It's, I think there's just a little bit of a debate about where those sit. Do they sit in the Python wrapper, or do they sit on the controller? Or perhaps in, a, in OSC, do they sit in a Cisco OpenSDN controller? Do we perhaps do some of that stuff on the front end web app server that sits in front of open daylight? And I'm not sure of the answer to that yet. So I think it's a watch this space as to how we do it. But feedback as to what you want is always helpful. You know. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. I think it's beer o'clock. And um, it is